So, Jesus is risen. That is the essential part of the Christian gospel, that Jesus is not dead, but he is alive. And I want to go through Mark chapter 16. If you have your Bibles, you can look at Mark 16. And I want to go through the account of the resurrection. The first thing you notice, that uh, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and the women, they come with spices to anoint him, to anoint the body. They believe that Jesus was dead and they wanted to anoint the body. Well, he had told them so many times, after three days, I will rise from the dead. Why didn't they believe it? Shouldn't they have gone there all on tiptoe, thinking, well, after three days, he's going to be alive? But they go there expecting to find a dead body, not a living body. All the way through, you see here, the weakness of the, of the disciples, the weakness of everybody, they, they don't believe the obvious. And so it is with us. The good news is quite simply that if you believe and are baptized, you will be saved because he died and rose for you. But that is so obvious and so clear that you almost don't see it. And there is something in human nature that is blind to the obvious. And this is so simple. And yet if you say to somebody, look, do you want to believe and be baptized and you can be saved? They're like, mm, I don't know. Oh, I don't know if I believe enough. I don't know. You see, I've got these questions. You see. see the obvious, that he wants to save you. And that means that you shall live forever and ever and ever with him. It is that simple. It is us who make it so difficult. So there they are, and they're talking amongst themselves, verse 3, who shall roll away the stone from the door of the tomb? We're just a bunch of women, and there's a great big stone. How are we going to roll that away? We can't do it. When they get there, they find it is rolled away already. So, little lesson there. Don't let problems become so big in your mind, you think about them all the time, because when you get to them, you often find that it's not there. The problem has been dealt with. So... And looking up, verse 4, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled aside. Looking up, they were walking along with their heads down, depressed. He's dead. They're in grief. And they look up, and then they see the stone has been rolled away. You know there's four Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when you put together all their records of the crucifixion, they appear to contradict each other. They don't. They're recording the same material, just from different, different uh, sides. And when you read those miserable books of criticisms of the Bible, they love to say, ah, oh, but if you put the gospel records together, you see it's all a fake. They all contradict each other. They don't. They're just different aspects of the same story. But I admit there are bits and pieces that are difficult to put together. For example, here it says... Looking up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled aside. They entered into the tomb, and they saw a young man dressed in white robes sitting on the right side, and they were frightened. Well, in one of the other Gospels, it says that an angel had rolled away the stone and was sitting on the stone in shining white. And the miserable critics say, well, here it sounds like they didn't even notice the angel. There's an angel had rolled the stone away and was sitting on it, uh, in shining white, and the guards who were supposed to be guarding the tomb were lying there on the ground like dead men, scared, absolutely terrified. Well, why didn't they notice it? Here it sounds like they didn't even notice that. People say, ah, there you are, contradiction. I must admit, I always did wonder a little bit about that. Until a few years ago, my mother died, and I was with her in the hospital before she died, and she died in my arms about... I don't know, 2 o'clock in the morning. And uh, I'd been in the hospital for ages of the day and the nights before with my mum. And finally she was dead. And they said, well, Mr. Heaster, you can go home and come back and get the death certificate. If you like to wait maybe uh, two hours, we can do the death certificate and then you're done. And I thought, well, I've been sit sick of sitting in this hospital for like, you know, it seemed forever. Why? Well, I was tired of being in the hospital. You know, hospitals don't have a very great uh, atmosphere, especially when your mum's just died. And I said, oh, I'll go out. And I walked out, all around this area where the hospital was. There was a parade of shops, every, all the shops were shut. And it was by uh, three o'clock in the morning, everything was shut. And I saw a petrol station. I thought I'd go to the petrol station. And I'd buy myself something to eat. I walked in the petrol station. 
I picked up at Miles Bar and a £20 note. I tried to pay them a £20 note. And the guy said, well, look, obviously, I haven't got any cash. You're going to have to pay with a credit card. I said, what do you mean, obviously, you haven't got any cash? He said, well, didn't you see what's just gone on? He said, you just walked past it. I said, what do you, what do you mean? He said, I got held up at gunpoint about 10 minutes ago. Those guys came up to me with guns <clears throat> and said, give, give us the cash. And I hit the emergency button and the police came in, oh, just in about three minutes. They were amazing. They came, they just appeared out of nowhere, the police. And didn't you see them? The police vans there with the flashing blue lights, you just walked right past them. You walked right past them. They had those guys tied up with handcuffs on, the guys who had the guns, and and they, the police were there in the vans of the flashing blue lights, and you just walked past them. He said, I was watching you. And I said, oh, really? And uh, he said, are you stoned? I said, no, I'm not stoned. Uh, he said, why didn't you see it? You, you walked past it. I was watching you. I said, look, mate, I'll tell you the truth. I was in the hospital around the corner, and my mum just died. And um, I'm waiting for the death certificate, so I came out for a walk. And he said, oh, yeah, if that makes sense. My point is, I walked past men with guns in a London suburb, right on the forecourt of a petrol station, with police with flashing blue lights. And I said to him, well, now you say it, yeah, I think there were some police around. And then now you say it, it come, yes, there were some police around and some fellas there. Yeah, he said, you walked right past them. They were looking at you like you might have been one of them. My point is, I walked past a crime scene with flashing blue lights, policemen, blokes with guns, and I didn't even notice because my mind was somewhere else. After that happened and I realised what had happened, I thought of this and I thought, yeah, that makes sense. The critics would say, well, in one of the Gospels it says there was an angel there in shining white garments and two gu and guards lying there dead, as if they were dead, and the women walked past them, and according to Mark, they didn't even notice it. Yeah, that makes sense. The critics say, oh, how, how do they not notice it? Yeah. If you're in grief, you can walk past an angel in white. That night when I was walking around that suburb, there could have been an angel in white standing there with a sword in his hand. I wouldn't have noticed it. Like I didn't notice those policemen. And the bloke said, didn't you see the police there? I said, yeah, now you say it. Yeah, 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 I think there were some police there. Yeah, yeah, now you say it. So... When you read this, this actually happened, and it has the ring of truth to it, that yes, that is what would happen. If you're in deep grief for someone you've loved, and you walk past an angel in white, you wouldn't necessarily notice it. Yes, this is not a contradiction. This has, to me, the ring of truth about it, that it really happened. And so... <clears throat> Jesus really did die. Jesus is real. God is real. Jesus really died, the one, the only one of all of us who didn't sin, and he really rose again. And that means that one minute there was a dead body wrapped as the women had wrapped him, as the manner of the Jews was to bury, in, in all the linen and all that. And then there was a movement, and whoosh, he stands there. Now, it, it says in John that when, they, when John and Peter went into the grave, they saw the grave clothes and the napkin, that is the, um, the, the head wrap, what was around his head, wrapped neatly by themselves. Who wrapped them up? There was nobody else there. Jesus arose, he came back to life, and he did what he probably learned to do from his mum when his little boy to wrap up your sheets. That's what they did. They all slept together in one room. When you uh, finished, when you woke up in the morning while well, you were going to use that same space to live in, he would have wrapped up his sheets and put them nicely. He did. I don't suppose anyone else did. This actually happened. The Son of God rose from the dead. And of course, the significance of that is that we, therefore, will live as he said. Because I live, you shall live also. If we are baptized into him, and that's why this account of the resurrection concludes with an appeal for baptism. If you go under that water in faith, that I die with Jesus, I come up out of the water like he rose from the dead, then his resurrection shall be mine. Because I live, you shall live also, he said. 
So there they were, depressed, looking down at the ground, but looking up, they see that the stone had been rolled aside. And the young man, who's obviously an angel, says to them, don't worry, he's risen, he's not here. Look at the place where he lay, empty space. Go and tell his disciples and Peter, that has the ring of truth in it, because Peter just denied Jesus, that he goes ahead of you into Galilee. Now there's something interesting. Jesus had said before he died, I will rise again and go before you into Galilee, and there you will see me in Galilee, in a mountain. He told them, a particular mountain in Galilee, that's where I'll see you. But actually, that isn't what he did. They were so weak in faith, so weak, that well, even when he was risen, they did not believe. And so he changed the plan, and he revealed himself to them in a, a locked room in Jerusalem. And then later on they meet in Galilee. It says John when he met them in Galilee, this was the third time he had revealed himself to them after he rose from the dead. So you see there how Jesus is open to change. Plan A, I will resurrect and I'll meet you in Galilee. There you will see me. Oh dear, they're not believing that I'm risen from the dead. Oh, he just appeared to them in in the uh, in a locked room, showed them the marks in his hands and the feet where the nails had been. So you see he's the same Jesus today, he's sensitive, he knows that this or that way you should cope with that, but you're so weak, okay, I'll, I won't let you have it. For example, it could have been in his plan that today you broke your leg on the way to church, so that you would go through certain experiences that would bring you closer to God. But because you're so weak, and because I'm so weak, well, actually, he didn't break your leg. You got here okay. He changed the plan. Now, how sensitive he is. Well, he tells them, go and tell everybody, the angel says, that Jesus has risen. But it says they said nothing to anyone. It's quite a theme in this account that people didn't believe that he was risen, and that he wants them to go and tell other people. Mary Magdalene is told to go and tell her brethren. The women are told to go and tell the disciples. And it comes to a, a crux at the end of it when he says, go and tell the whole creation. And yet people were very slow to do that, just like we are. You know, do you believe that he rose from the dead? <coughs> we should all put our hands up and say, yes, I do. Right, well then, tell somebody go into all the world. It's not so much, well, I'll go to church, so if you guys want to come, you can come here. He says, go. There's got to be something proactive. And if, like me, you're a bit shy about, you know, raising these issues about Jesus and all that, pray that God will give you meetings of people whom you can tell. That's what I do. Every morning and every evening, I pray that God will give me meetings with somebody today, somehow, online or in real life, someone to whom I can share this message. Well, it notes in verse 9 that he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he'd cast out seven demons. Well, in the Bible, <coughs> demon possession, I suggest, is another way of saying someone was mentally ill. And to have demons cast out of you meant that you were cured from your mental illness. So, Mary Magdalene, and this is a bit of a long story, but I reckon you can prove that Mary Magdalene was the woman in the city who was a sinner who anointed Jesus' feet. So she was a prostitute, or she had been a prostitute. And she had a history of mental illness, and she was a woman. Well, under Roman and Jewish law, a woman had no legal power as a, as a, as a witness. If a woman stood up in court and said, I saw him steal it, uh, she's a woman. Uh, her testimony doesn't mean anything. Let alone a woman who'd been a prostitute, a woman who'd had a history of mental illness. But Jesus chose her as the primary number one witness. And again, the way he meets her is amazing. She'd come to the tomb and <clears throat> to anoint his body, and she see someone there and she thinks it's the gardener and she says hey like what are you done with a body and jesus turns and says to her mary and she's like wow it's jesus 
Now, what you see from that is that Jesus did not resurrect with a halo of glory around his head, dressed in white shining clothes. He arose and appeared as a gardener, as a working man. And I presume that the gardener probably left his clothes somewhere in the cave, nearby the cave where Jesus was buried. So he, he wrapped up his, uh, his own grave clothes and uh, what do you wear? He's the son of God who is risen from the dead with all power in heaven and earth. Of course, he could have just clothed himself with any old clothes, but picked out the bloke's uh, clothes, working clothes, put them on. Why I love that is that it shows how he is close to us. How although he has risen from the dead, he is not so far removed from us. And when he says to her, Mary, I think she recognized his voice. Although he'd been dead, he had the same tone of voice that he had. Like if Cindy says to me, Duncan, I know that's Cindy's voice. If Evia says, Duncan, or Daddy, I know that's her voice. And it's the same with Mary. When Jesus said to her, Mariam, Mary, wow, this is, that's Jesus. And so, as Paul says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, that the same Jesus, who spoke in the same way, as he did when he was on earth, when he was mortal, it's the same one today, and it's the same one with whom we shall meet. The Jesus who died to save people, the Jesus who loved little children, the Jesus who didn't like hypocrisy and Phariseeism and all this, this is the same Jesus with whom we have to do today. And so, she, as Mary, was the, uh, was the number one witness when she had everything against her, really, in terms of her credibility. So we all think, oh, who am I? Who am I as a witness? I'm not an evangelist. Who am I? I'm just some obscure bloke. I'm some obscure man or woman from wherever we're from. Yes, we are obscure little people. But this is characteristic of how God works. You, with all your sense of me, no, no not me, Yes, you. He wants to use. And in fact, it's your sense of lack of qualification. But oh, who am I? Yeah, that is in fact our qualification. So then he tells them to go out with a message. But he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Verse 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. But he that disbelieves will be condemned. Who was it who disbelieved? It was them. All through the run up to this, they didn't believe. Mary Magdalene tells them, and they didn't believe. He appears, it says, to two as they were going into the countryside. They went away and told it to the rest who did not believe them either. So it was the disciples who had disbelieved. And Jesus says, now go and tell everybody. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who disbelieves will be condemned. They'd have thought, he who disbelieves, well, that's me. It was me five minutes ago. In other words, in the preaching of the gospel, we are aware of our own frailty that I did not ought to be here, that I am not a believer as I, sh I have not been a believer as I should have been. I deserve to be condemned. And so <clears throat> these Gospels that you read are transcripts of how they preach the Gospel. The rest, I suggest, is interpretation and theology. But the essence of the Gospel is in these Gospel records because the essence of the Gospel is Jesus. And the things about him and his kingdom, they're all here, in the Gospels. And so, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. That's why I urge you, if you have not been baptized, to be baptized. Not into any name of any church or any theology, but just simply into Jesus. If you'd like to be baptized, talk to Cindy or Mike or Vanessa or Daniel or me. Be really happy to help you to do that. So then, he has risen. And because of that, we shall live forever. You shall live forever. I shall live forever. If we're connected with him. And that means that this life is like a, a millimeter compared to the eternal long, long line of God's kingdom that has got no end. On and on and on. Forever and ever and ever and ever. If you've only got hope in this life, Paul says, you are of all men most miserable. Because what is this life? Is it so great to live in Riga for the, for the next you know, million years, hundred years, no. Even if you've got all the money in the world, even if you are Bill Gates, even if you are whoever, Steve Jobs, in the end, it doesn't last very long and it's not a great life, and it's game over. Before you know where you are, it's game over. That's it. That was all it was. Just a moment. 
Whereas we have got the real hope of the real life, which is not now. This isn't the real thing. This is just a little test at the beginning. Right. This gets over 70, 80, or 90 years, if you're not so lucky. You cough and hack your way through all this stuff. Okay, when, when all that gets over and done with, then when Jesus comes, we have this definite hope of resurrection and of life eternal because he rose from the dead. And that is absolutely solid. He rose from the dead. And because I live, he said, you shall live also. Thank you. <clears throat>